I'm Hazel Green. I'm a writer. I worked in theater, film, radio for many years. And then for about 10 years now, I've worked with digital interactive media, um, really to find any way possible of getting us away from the screens and it, it, out into the real world. So I've worked with games, apps, um, robots. I've worked with smell. I work with all kinds of performance and any, any kind of medium that I can find, mix that with the kind of magic of new technology to create meaningful experiences for us, but getting us away from being stuck to a screen. Having said that, I'm just about to try VR for the first time, that kind of thing. But it's all a journey towards something. So um, what I'm going to talk to you about today is this whole day is about play. Uh, I want to talk to you about collaboration and creativity <coughs> and how, in our case with this project I'm talking to you about and how I very often work is how artists and engineers can actually work together and have a good time. Um, but very different backgrounds, very different approaches very often. Um, sh show of hands, at who considers themselves to be a creative type of person? Can you put your hands up? Quite a lot of you, not all of you. And who would you generally say more like an engineer or a computer scientist or something like that? A few of you. Well, I'm here to tell you that you can be both, okay? So, um, I've called it how we build a robot. Um, I'm referring to a program that was on Channel 4 uh, just last Christmas. Uh, it was a, f a documentary film of a project um, that we made in Bristol, which is where I'm from. And um, the, the film followed us over a really short period, about three months, making a robot, which is a ridiculously short amount of time, as those of you probably know or imagine. Instead of years, we did it in months with a big team of about 15 people, all very different disciplines all coming together so that this kind of sprint run of how can we make a robot, but not just any robot, but a robot that is friendly, that is huggable. So it was about tactile. We were trying to get around this idea of robots being these kind of s stiff, humanoid type things, but more about a kind of tactile um, experience, how to explore that. What we really were doing was thinking of it in terms of an animation character rather than an engineering project. It was, so if you think about that, more like a Pixar character than a functional kind of machine. It was much more about that, and that's where I come in. So what I always bring to any of the projects is story and character and humor. So that's what we were aiming to do with this little robot. Um, I come from Bristol, from the Pervasive Media Studio. I don't know if you know it, have visited it already. Um, this is a panoramic shot of the type of space it is, kind of similar to the space we're in now. It's a permanent place. We're just about to celebrate our 10-year anniversary this coming weekend. Um, people come and go. I've been there since the beginning. I don't know, I'm just going for some kind of honorary membership. I'm one of the older ones. Um, it's a mixture of creative people and technologists and academics. We've got um, a department from the University of West of England in there as well. What it's all about is collaboration and community. Um, people have their own projects, some people are small businesses, um, but it's about working together, serving each other, um, we have lots of events, and the idea is that you get it for free, you don't have to pay for your desk, you don't have to pay 
for the team of producers that are there, for the admin, for all of that. All this space is free. What you do have to do is give back something to share. And uh, from that, loyalty comes anyway. I'm here talking about it today, not because they've asked me to or because I have to. It's because I passionately believe in this community. It's my community. I can go there at weekends. And that's what's important. So if you do want to make a great project, it is about the space, like the space you're in now. So the Pervasive Media Studio is based in a bigger centre, in the centre of Bristol. And actually, yes, this slide is just some of the organisations that I've worked for over the past 10 years through the Pervasive Media Studio, through my network in Bristol. That's why it's important to build this community and network. So you'll see there, at the top left, you'll see Rusty Squid, which is the name of the company I'll be talking about a bit more today, who um, were behind the robot project. They brought me in as a freelancer, as it were. Um, then you'll see the two universities in Bristol, uh, always a big part of this kind of work, uh, University of Bristol and University of West of England. Um, along next to that, you'll see the Bristol Robotics Lab. That's a joint venture between the two universities. And um, I've always loved robots. I've always been a science fiction fan from a storytelling point of view, from sci-fi movies point of view. I've always loved it. And when I was, you'll see down there HP, that was Hewlett Packard Labs. I was artist in residence there many years ago. They were next door to the robot labs, so I, I just got to go. I just knocked on the door and said, can I come in? I love robots. And they let me in, and I've been sort of collaborating with them on and off for, for many years. Um, they need storytellers. Most of them are engineers. And then you'll see um, theatre companies that I worked for for many years. So I was a performer, an actor, comedian for many years. I shouldn't say comedian because now you might expect me to be funny at some point. Um, then we've got an other media centres in the Bristol area. We've got the BBC R&D, which are up in Salford. We've got Ardman Animation. I worked for them for quite a long time um, in their digital department. And Channel 4, of course, National Youth Theatre, Tate Gallery, I've done apps for them, Warner Brothers, Paramount, and the Science Museum down here, you'll see. So that's the Science Museum in London, um, and the Science Museum in Bristol. So, and then you'll see across there, we've got the Aben and Somerset Constabulary, I'm doing a project with the police. And then you've got various funders, that, uh, like the local council, Creative England, European Union, I feel sad even just looking at the logo ahead of time. So, and Arts and Humanities Research Council. So, what I'm saying is that all of these kinds of organisations I've had to go to and build up my relationship with over the years with help from the community that I'm in. And this is how you get to make things like a robot with lots of interesting people. So, yes, so this is where the studio is, is based, um, in lovely Bristol. So you'll see up there, we're down by the harbour side, and it's in a centre called Watershed, which is a m cinema, multi-screen cinema, um, cafe, bar, and we just opened the Bristol VR Lab, which is like a sister hub to the Pervasive Media Studio which it currently has in it small virtual reality companies. Uh, it's a slightly different business model there. They pay for their desk space. But again, it's about having um, events on, bringing the public in. So this is a really important point that I want to make, um, is that being in a space where the public share it with you is really important. One of the problems with universities, although they're brilliant places to work with, as an outsider, as an artist, because you've got expertise and resources. And once you get through the doors, you've got passionate people 
who really want to work with you, but it's the size of the organization, the, the barriers to, over, to overcoming universities. Those of you who may work at universities may be nodding. The, 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 the different departments are completely locked off, and it's really difficult to do anything between departments. And if you found that yourselves, you wanted to just do something over there, and you, you can't because of the, the kind of the administration of it's really locked down. That's frustrating and doesn't reflect the outside world. What's um, great about other spaces is that the public come and go in and out. It's much more of a conversation with the rest of the world. It's not so much of a bubble. Do visit us anytime you like. You can um, look me up and come and see me and I'll show you around. Um, so we're getting to the robot. We are getting to the robot. These are the kind of individuals, the type of people that I often work with. Digital agencies have been a big part of my um, career so far. They're advertising agencies, essentially. They tend to make websites, but they try and be more and more creative. And um, digital agency directors, creative directors, academics, researchers, chefs, technologists, actors, all that whole list is a complete, um, in no particular order, it's a complete mixture of people who are doing interesting things, who are passionate about what they do, and being in a place like this one, and being the kind of curious person that you undoubtedly are, because you're here, you just need to approach people and say, would you be interested in doing this? And before you know it, you're doing something extraordinary and new. So, you know, we work with, with chefs, uh, experimenting with, with food, food technology, and then it comes into working with smell and taste. And, and then moving on to the, the robot project, we had computer scientists, designers, engineers, puppeteers, dancers, performers, writer, that was me. I was a performer as well. Um, all different kinds of people all coming together to make this different kind of robot. So, why we built a robot, this is one of the reasons that is why we built this kind of robot. The idea was that it would be autonomous, um, so it's an artificial intelligence, um, that when it worked properly, that it would be able to be left in the street, it would be recording through a camera in its, one of its eyes, it was carrying a microphone, so it could see and hear, and it could respond to could speak and it moves around as well. I'll show you a film clip in a minute. So that it can answer people's questions, it can ask questions, it can answer by making statements about what it wants and it can ask people questions. And this is part of writing AI. If any of you are interested in writing artificial intelligence or chatbots, which is simplest form. It's a bit like theatre in that you, you make simple suggestions and people fill in the rest with their imagination. So you, your robot, your AI, your chatbot doesn't have to be able to completely understand everything that's being said, but it can, if it hears a question or it can hear a statement, it can say, oh, ha uh -huh, carry on tell me more, that kind of thing. And it feels like it's listening to you. So being listened to is a really important part. It makes us feel good as robots. Um, the children responded to it fantastically. As you can see, this is genuine. They, they, they you know, they, you can see this little girl here. She's explaining what love is, I think. She seems to be touching her heart. 
uh, the questions we designed for it to ask was about what does love feel like? What, what does it, do you recommend being a human? You know, what's, what's it all about? And children particularly were just really thoughtful and caring and amazing as they can be. Um, so let me just see if I can. But the robot is having a hard time winning trust from the public. What's your name? Beep up. Are you a robot? Beep up. Yeah. Beep. Pick me up. Pick me up. Please. between humans and machines? Yes. The, the difference between humans and, and machines are humans have feelings, machines don't, okay? Beepop, can you tell me something you've never told anyone before? Um, whisper it in my ear if you're shy. No need to whisper. I am proud for who I am. Beepop. I just sound like I'm a hard working person at school, which I am. But sometimes I kind of slack off when I'm at home. Beep up up. How do you know? Beep up. Because I can tell when I'm always sitting on the couch. I never, I never get off the couch. I just sleep, sleep, sleep. I sleep through my alarms all the time. Would you recommend being human? Mm, yeah, because you learn stuff. You learn from your mistakes. It's fun. You make friends. Sometimes you can make enemies, but soon they can become allies. Hello, robot. Friend? Friends? Hello. Should we hug? No. Pick me up, babe. <laughs> oh my god. Oh my god. Beautiful, beautiful. So, so delightful, so lovely, and that's just, just what we wanted. Um, th those kinds of responses. Um, the, uh, there, were, there were issues, obviously, with the building of the robot in such a quick amount of time. It was heavier than we wanted. It wasn't as cuddly as we wanted. You, you can tell that um, it had to have a kind of plastic base. It had to have loads of gubbins that was in there that was fairly heavy. Um, we, um, it, when it rains, it had a little plastic mac on, which is adorable. There are some, lots of photos online that you'll be able to see. Um, 
So we tried to, I was going to say humanise it then, actually, but, you, you know, so give it plenty of character as much as possible. And um, its head movements and a way it can lean, lean forward was very important to people. Um, OK, so uh, just to tell you a little bit about my role. So the voice you heard was my voice with a little bit of a filter put on it. Um, I wrote everything that it said, because um, I have a, this background now with writing chatbots, AI, and um, being able to think about every single um, uh, different possibility of what um, people might ask it or say to it, or what, what it needs to be able to respond in terms of verbal feedback and verbal questions and how, as I was just saying, how you can get around um, that sort of feeling that it's not listening or it's saying the wrong thing. Uh, obviously, it took many iterations. We went out in the street quite a few times with different um, versions of it. I'll show you some pictures of that. Um, and so it takes a lot of trial and error. And you do have to write hundreds and hundreds of lines of dialogue. So any, if any of you are dialogue writers, it's, you have to write a little bit of um, dialogue to go with, with the m many, many, many lines of code that are programmed into it as well, just for it to say simple things like, you know, tell me more. Or I can't do the voice now. But it's like, um, do you recommend being human? That kind of thing. Um, so what we did, this photo, you can see me with the microphone there. So when you see the full film, and it's on Channel 4 online now, uh, when you see the full film, you'll see that um, we started out um, with out in the streets. So I, just, I was watching people interacting with uh, the early prototypes, the little puppets we had. And it, had, it just had a little um, speaker stuck in its base. So that it seemed to be speaking to you. It seemed to be like a full autonomous robot. Um, very often with these things, you need to cheat. You need to puppet it. Usually, I say, puppets are much better than robots anyway, because they, you can do that. And it takes like six months to make a robot do anything near that. So a sock puppet would get better results, if you, depending what you need. So we. So I would watch, and from a distance, voice um, what the robot was saying and asking. And we based a lot of what would be good content to have um, from those interactions. Um, at the top here, you'll see, like, I don't know if you can actually see what that is, but it's a puppet. It's just like a plastic bowl with a simple mechanism. This is David's hands here, and he's just moving, almost just like a Muppet, moving its hands kind of like that. And you can also move its head, so it had a face-like mask. And the children instantly responded to it just as much as they did with the, the, the full-on robot. So they are shaking its hand, holding its hand, and they're reaching in because it's asked them to. So, and then this strange picture here is, as you'll see in the film as well, it's me recording the voiceover. So I, it was about being, for it, it being hugged for the first time, this character. So I had to kind of act it out to get the, the right sounds out. Um, so that was all part of the process. So you can see how that's kind of like animation as well, this, as you'll see through the the process of how an animation is made with um, voice being recorded and character design. Um, so again, some different prototypes that we went through about just like a cuddly tube. And then we ended up with this kind of um, just the two eyes. And this is a hole for the camera here, just really early prototypes. And that's the team there. Uh, I, by no means do I want to suggest that it was all about me, just because these photographs are, are of me. This is because today I'm talking from my point of view. Um, none of these guys are here to talk about it. Um, but it was a, a big mixed team. 
um, not just guys, so there's women and men, and um, of all these different disciplines all working together in this studio space in Bristol. So these are um, some of the animation characters that we were thinking about while we were designing it. I was certainly thinking about it in terms of the character, its story, what its relationship is with you. Because in, in these kinds of narratives, it's you, you are in place of the camera, if you know what I mean? It's, about, it's more like game design in the, rather than film design. Um, Wally, of course, um, just heartbreakingly um, lonely, but just getting on with his own little thing, doing his thing, um, which was what our robot was like. It was kind of there to find out what this human life was all about. Um, E.T. and Elliot here, of course, it's about that is it symbiotic relationship between between E.T. and Elliot, they almost merged as one. They were one of each other. And of course, E.T. needed to get home and Elliot needed to help E.T. And then we've got Big Hero 6, that mainly because of it just being so squishy and inflatable and cuddly, we tried inflatable ones. Um, it wasn't quite practical. but. It, you can see film of that as well, which I'll show you in a minute. So, yeah, what I'm wanting to say is this is another still from that, but it's, we are the public too, okay? So, we are the audience, we are the public. Don't try and make something without thinking about your place in the world and the community that you're in, because that is how you will make something important and meaningful, rather than just keeping your head down. You've got all these resources of all these other people around you in this room, in this building, in this university, but in the city. Um, many of you may also already be working collaboratively online, globally. I'm sure you are. I'm sure you, I don't need to tell you this but always think about the audience when you're making something. Okay, so um, I'm going to show you another little film now. So the person you see there is David McGoran. He um, was the head of this project. He was trained as a dancer. He's trained as a dancer, then he retrained as a robotics engineer. He's now a robot designer and animatronic designer heads up this team in Bristol which I joined for this project and we worked together on various things. He's also a Canadian, he asked me to tell you. Um, so um, the Channel 4 film was for a Channel 4 audience, for a broad audience about the story of um, David, this guy um, wanting to make this robot, it's about loneliness and was it about his own loneliness and all that kind of thing. What he then wanted to make was something about the making, the design process of how you build this kind of robot. So okay. Sure. okay, so yeah, we started with balls, with cardboard boxes, all kinds of materials. Um, squishy, squashy, floaty. Um, this is the inflatable one that one of our team built. I think that was actually my favourite. So then it's about, like it says at the side, then we add motion. How will it, could it move around? It would have to stay on the spot. We couldn't really, in time, make a robot that could walk. How would it rotate? So this is a little, very sweet little puppet that we made. It's one that we tried out on the children in the street. Then there's wriggling. And then servo motors. 
things that drive the actions, drive the, the joints inside. Plenty of those. And those, those control things are, are, are what are built in-house to, to sort of puppet the robot, if that makes a sense. So again, you can see how complex it's starting to be. And there we go, it's starting to come together. These are all the things that the robots are able to do now. You see, it really looks like it's looking. I love those little dungarees. So we decided we'd have a button on the front. We tried all kinds of things, how you invite conversation and get people's um, permission. These are all the different kinds of abilities it has. So it had touch sensors in it, in its head, where you would stroke its head. That's one of it way. And then one of the things we designed in deliberately, really, was for it to fall over so that it needed help. And of course, we employed artists and illustrators all through the process to help us visualize it. This is an example of the kinds of uh, design process. Though you can see inside the, um, the amount of wiring but it is doing its own thing there. And that's the finished robot. So it's lighting up eyes, it's light, lighting up chest and buttons. So just while we watch that, I did. I I work with a lot of character designers a lot. Um, for instance, at Ardman, uh, on this project, on lots of projects, very often, as with just the way that everyone thinks, the default character is gendered and it's male. Everyone always refers to everything, if they're not sure, as he. He wants me to go with him, pick him up. It's, so it's always referred to as a he. And I just make it my thing. I try and try and try to change that default mode from either to an it or to a she, but without taking a robot and saying sticking a pink bow on its head, which is usually what's done to make things female rather than male. Uh, I don't like that either. Um, so as you can see, it's a cultural thing and it's still very, very difficult to stop people referring to everything as a he because we're so used to um, the default character for human or robot being he without it being overtly a certain kind of feminine. Um, I just wanted to you know, plant that in your mind that it was something I would bang on about almost every day, always have to... Um, with, with designers of any kind, we're left to it. They will generally just create a male character. Ardman Animations, when I was there, we were told that no female central characters because they don't sell. I'll leave that thought with you. So, um, that's, that's my final slide. Um, this, uh, you'll see here the uh, subtitle. So this guy in Bristol said, uh, asked the robot if it wanted some chicken curry. He said, you're too sensitive, mate. You're too sensitive, mate. Yeah, do you want some chicken curry? Um, so yeah, you can, you, the, the film is now on all four again. So um, you can see it as soon as you want to. So go to channel four online, all four, see the whole program. That's an hour long, as you may have noticed, David Tennant's narrating it. It was directed by James Newton. Um, and uh, any of the, the other films, Rusty Squid have got their own YouTube channel and their own website if you want to investigate that. Pervasive Media Studio websites, and you can find me, best place to find me daily is on Twitter. 